Chapter 5 of The Hodge Egg What Max had not bargained for when the bunch of people moved off at the peep, peep, peep of the little green man was that another bunch would be coming towards him from the other side of the street, so that when he was about halfway across, hurrying along at the heels of the crowd, he was suddenly confronted by another. He dodged in a forest of legs, in danger of being stepped on. No one seemed to notice his small shape, and indeed he was kicked by a large foot and rolled backwards. Picking himself up, he looked across and found, to his horror, the little green man had gone and the red man had reappeared. Frantically, Max ran on as the traffic began to move and reached the far side inches in front of a great wheel that almost brushed his, brushed his backside. The shock of so narrow an escape made him roll up and for some time he lay in the gutter whilst above his head the human stepped onto or off the pavement and the noisy green man and the silent red man lit up in turn. After a while... There seemed to be fewer people about, and Max uncurled and climbed over the curb. He turned right and set off in the direction of home. How to recross the street was something he had not worked out yet, but in his experience neither striped bits nor red and green men were the answer. As usual he kept close to the wall at the inner edge of the pavement, a wall that presently gave place to iron railings. These were wide enough, apart from even the largest hedgehog, to pass between them. Max slipped through. In the light of a full moon he could see before him a wide stretch of grass and he ran across it until the noise and stink of the traffic were left behind. Am I where? said Max, looking around him. His nose told him of the scent of flowers in the ornamental gardens. His eyes told him of a strange shaped building, the bandstand, and his ears told him of the sound of splashing water, as the fountain spouted endlessly in the lily pond. Of course, this was the place that Pa had told them all about. This was the park. Hip, hip, ray! cried Max to the moon, and away he ran. For the next few hours he trotted busily about the park, shoving his snout into everything. Like most children, he was not only nosy, but noisy too, and at the sound of his, of his coming, the mice scuttled under the bandstand, the snakes slid through the ornamental gardens, and the frogs plopped into the safe depths of the lily pond. Max caught nothing. Look at this beautiful park. At last he began to feel rather tired and to think how nice it would be to go home to bed. But which way was home? Max considered this and came to the unhappy conclusion that he was lost. Just then he saw, not far away, a hedgehog crossing the path. A large hedgehog, a par-sized hedgehog. What luck! Pa had crossed the street to find him. He ran forward, but when he reached the animal, he found it was a complete stranger. Oh, said Max, I beg your pardon. I thought you were a different hodgehog. The stranger looked curiously at him. Are you feeling all right? He said. Yes, thanks, said Max. Trouble is, I go to want home, but I won't know the day. You mean you don't know the way? Yes. Well, where do you live? asked the strange hedgehog. Number 5A. Indeed. Well now, listen carefully, young fellow. Go up this path, it will take you back to the street, and a little way along you'll see a strange sort of house that humans use. It's a tall house, just big enough for one human to stand up in and it has windows on three sides and it's bright red. If you cross there, you'll fetch up right by your own front gate. OK. K.O. said Max, and thanks. 
As soon as he was through the park railings, he saw the tall red house. He trotted up close to it. It was lit up, and sure enough, there was a human inside it. He was holding something to his ear, and Max could see that his lips were moving. How odd, thought Max, moving in very close now. He's standing talking to himself. At that instant, the man put down the receiver and pushed open the door of the telephone booth. A door designed to clear the pavement by about an inch, the perfect height for giving an inquisitive young hedgehog, for the second time in his short life, a tremendous bang on the head. Oh, poor, poor Max, he's not having a good time, is he? Chapter 6 Meanwhile, back at number 5A, Pa had had a bonanza, sneaking next door and finding a full saucer of dog food and no sign of his neighbour, he had scoffed the lot. He came staggering back, very full of himself and munchy meat, and fell into a deep bloated sleep. Ma woke him up just before dawn. Pa, she said, wake up, Max hasn't come back. Pa opened his eyes and saw her worried face and their three smaller but equally worried faces of Peony, Pansy and Petunia. He's been gone all night, said Ma. Oh, Pa, do you think something's happened to him? Ah, oh, look, we all look a bit worried about him. Pa got to his feet. I don't know, he said, but don't fret, Ma, I'll find him. But he could be anywhere. How are you going to know where to look? Before Pa could answer, he heard a strange voice coming from the hedge that divided 5A and 5B. Excuse me, said the strange voice, and out poked the head of their neighbour. Pa bristled his spine, standing on end. It's that munchy meat, he thought. He's found the empty saucer and he's going to cut up rough about it. Well, I can play rough too. I don't like, like the look of him anyway, and if he wants to fight, he'll have one. We'll soon see who's the better hog. But before he could think of anything to say, the hedgehog from 5B came out of the hedge and said again, Excuse me. Well, said Pa, I couldn't help overhearing what you were saying. Family matter, growled Pa. Exactly. You're worried about your little lad. Oh, cried Ma. Have you seen him? Yes, I have. At least I met a young chap in the park who said he was lost and looking for a way back to 5A. Unless, of course, it was a 5A in some other street. Did you notice anything different about him? said Ma quickly. The neighbour looked a little bit embarrassed. Well, yes, he said. Now that you come to mention it, he seemed to be having a little bit of difficulty with his speech, muddled some of his words now and then. Like Hodgeg. Yes. <gasps> That's our Max, cried Ma. Well, was he all right? asked Pa. Not hurt or anything. No, he was fine. I told him the best way to go home. He'll be along soon, I'm sure. Try not to worry. Pa cleared his throat awkwardly. His neighbour's ki kindness greatly added to his feelings of guilt. It's very decent of you, he said. Glad to help. That's what neighbours are for. Can we offer you something, said Ma, bread and milk? Oh, no, thanks, said the neighbour. I had a pretty good night's hunting in the park. Just as well, because when I got home, I found that something had eaten all my munchy meat. He looked directly at Pa, and his eyes were twinkling. It was a cat, I expect, he said, and went back through the hedge. Well, wasn't that nice of him, said Ma, and Peony, Pansy and Petunia all chanted, Nice! Pa grunted. A part of him thought he should confess his sin to his neighbour, but then another part of him for he was very worldly wise, thought the least said was soonest mended. Life was full enough of headaches. The same thought occurred to Max when at last he came to his senses. The door of the telephone booth had knocked him out cold and the neighbour from number 5B had not noticed the still small figure as he hurried to cross the deserted street before the morning rush hour began. 
Oh, thought Max, has any hedgehog ever had a more horrible headache? The last bang I got made me talk a bit funny, and I expect this one's made things worse. I'll try saying something. Oh, said Max, has any hedgehog ever had a more horrible headache? Max considered this. It sounded fine. Suddenly he felt fine. Even the headache felt much less. My name, he said softly, is Victor Maximilian St George. And, he said more loudly, I have three sisters called Peony, Pansy and Petunia and I live with Ma and Pa at number 5A and I'm a very lucky hedgehog. And without thinking, without listening, without a single glance left or right, he dashed across the street, straight in front of the first of the morning vehicles, the milk van. The noise that followed was enough to wake the whole street. First there was a screech as the milk van braked and swerved, and then came the shattering sound of dozens and dozens of bottles smashing. Lastly came the sound of the milkman's voice, cursing every hedgehog ever born, as he danced with rage in a sea of gold top and silver top and semi-skimmed and skimmed, orange juice, grapefruit juice and fresh farm eggs all over the floor. Ma and Pa had sent their girls to bed and were waiting up in the growing light of dawn. They were crouching side by side listening when suddenly the dreadful racket burst upon their ears. <gasps> Sounds like something's got run over, said Pa heavily. Brace yourself, old lady. It could be our Max. Ma buried her head and rolled herself into a ball. At that moment, they heard a cheery voice. Oh, look at them. Look at the milkman. He looks very angry. Now, now, it said. What's all the fuss about? There's no point in crying over spilt milk. I wonder if that's Max. We'll have to wait and see tomorrow when we read chapter seven. Bye.